Uh, thanks to all of our attendees and panelists for joining us. My name is Stefan Johnson, and I'm the Transportation Program Manager for CLEAR, or Clean Energy Economy for the Region. We are a nonprofit energy consultancy based on Colorado's Western Slope, and we manage the Colorado Clean Diesel Program. And as many of you may know, this week is National Drive Electric Week. Uh, and cars and, and vans and buses and trucks are getting most of the attention, but I think it's important to point out that they are not the only things that are getting electrified. I'm going to read a quick statement from a recent funding opportunity from the United States Department of Energy that I think underlines the importance of the sector and what we're about to talk about this morning. Construction equipment makes up the largest share of the energy use and GHG emissions for commercial off-road vehicles. These vehicles make repetitive movements which offer the opportunity for energy recovery and storage. As they are often used in urban centers, criteria emissions can be a concern, and some international cities have proposed banning diesel engines. Electrification technologies offer unique benefits for improving the energy efficiency and reducing the emissions of commercial off-road construction equipment. So we're super excited to hear from some of the companies that are leading the charge in terms of bringing electric construction equipment to the market. Um, but before we dive into those companies, we're first gonna have some admin to get out of the way, but it's very important as admin as we're going to be telling you about how you can apply for a grant to offset the cost of purchasing one of these pieces of electric construction equipment. My colleague Zuleika Pebic will be going over the details of the Colorado Clean Diesel Program and applying for a grant with us. Then we're gonna be hearing from John M. Williams, the CEO of Green Machine. Next, we're gonna be hearing from Dr. Ray Gallant, VP of Product at Volvo Construction. And last but not least, we're gonna be hearing from Joe Shinasi, Business Development with Covico Electric. We've reserved plenty of time at the end for attendees to connect directly with our presenters to ask questions but please feel free to enter your questions or comments into the chat or Q&A during the presentations, and we will make sure that they get addressed before the end of the webinar. And as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and we will distribute the recording and slides to all attendees after the webinar. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Zuleika. Lake, I think you're still muted. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> Isn't that classic? Um, I'm just going to quickly reintroduce myself. Um, so I'm Zuleika. I am the um, Clean Energy Program Manager at CLEAR and the Colorado Clean Diesel Program Manager. Um, and so thank you all very much for attending today. And we're really excited to be able to offer this funding to businesses across Colorado. Um, like Stefan said, I'll be going over the grant funding that is available through the Colorado Clean Diesel Program or CCDP for replacing diesel machines with electric or hybrid electric versions. Okay, next slide, Stefan. The Colorado Clean Diesel Program is the state offering of the EPA's Federal Diesel Emissions Reduction Act, or DERA, funding. The EPA provides grants on a federal level, and if states want to participate, they are allocated funds to run their own programs. The purpose of the program is to provide funds and rebates that protect human health and improve air quality by reducing harmful emissions from diesel engines. 
So CLEAR has contracted with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to run the program in the state of Colorado. So besides the state allocated DARA funds, the CCDP also has funding from Colorado's VW diesel emission settlement added to the pot. And this portion of the funding must go to zero emission solutions. So we're really excited that there are zero emissions options available now. And so we are clear from the get go, the CCDP only funds off-road vehicles and machinery. We can't fund fleet EVs such as cars and trucks. So up until now, DARA funding across the United States has largely been used for upgrading older diesel engines with newer ones, which is important, but not really the true purpose of the funding. So in our contract with the CDPHE, we are mandated to find and fund projects that are utilizing hybrid or zero emissions technologies. So these can be through the purchase of new cutting, ed cutting edge machines or by replacing a diesel engine with a zero emissions power source. And as these technologies are becoming more common and available, there are more and more options for interested people. So please keep in mind throughout this presentation that the CCDP did not develop and does not have the ability to change the guidelines of the program. They are national guidelines developed by the EPA. And I'll tell you right off the bat that the funding does come with some strict guidelines, including the requirement that a similar diesel machine that's getting the replacement funded needs to be scrapped completely. So next slide, please. So there is a spectrum of available grant funding to cost share ratios, depending on the equipment being purchased. For hybrid electric machines, the maximum grant funding is 25% of the total project cost. And the total project cost can include the electrical infrastructure needed to support the new machine, charging stations, operator mechanic training, and other expenses directly related to upgrading to uh, either hybrid or fully electric machines um, or zero, other zero emissions. The example that we have here is for a project with a total cost cost of $100,000. So the CCDP can rebate $25,000 and the applicant would be responsible for the remaining $75,000. So next slide, please. In a zero emissions upgrade, the maximum grant funding available increases to 45%. So what we hope is that the grant award covers the incremental cost between a zero emissions machine and a new diesel machine. So customers are paying a premium for these new technologies, but the savings in fuel and maintenance over time also help make up some of the upfront costs. Next slide, please. Um, and there are eligibility requirements. The important ones um, here are um, that the machine being replaced and the new machine are registered in Colorado and that the equipment being replaced is owned, not leased by the applicant. Um, so you, you have to, the, the machine that you are scrapping has to be registered in Colorado and the machine that you are purchasing has to be registered in Colorado. Next slide, please. Okay, so now this is the hard sell of this funding. <laughs> Due to the purpose of the funding being to reduce diesel emissions, a like-for-like -like machine needs to be completely destroyed to be eligible. And it needs to be a machine in good working order that has been used regularly in the past two years. Plus it has to have at least three years of remaining life. So the applicant can combine operating hours of multiple units to get to 500 hours if they're willing to scrap both or all of the machines that they use to combine those hours. The remaining life is the fleet owner's estimate of the number of years until the unit would have been retired from service if the unit were not being upgraded or scrapped because of the grant funding. So also we would like to be replacing the older and dirtier tier three and lower engines, but we can also fund removing tier four engines if they're being replaced by a zero emissions alternative. Next slide. So the scrappage requirement is pretty particular and we're, we can't do it on the honor system. So the engine block has to have a three inch hole cut into it and both chassis rails have to be cut in half. 
Um, and all of this has to be documented with photos. So since this is a key requirement, it is very important that it is done correctly and evidenced appropriately. You don't wanna scrap a piece of equipment, get it hauled off to the recycler and then end up without the proper evidence to get your funding. Next slide. And the Colorado Clean Diesel Program accepts applications on a rolling basis. Um, so you can submit your application at any time. This slide just gives a general idea of how the timeline could work. So if you were to apply this month or in October, um, you could expect funding totally dependent on the supply chain and everything working in your favor. Um, you could get funds probably by February. Um, so this slide, um, sorry, if you're interested in the program and applying, I would strongly recommend reaching out to me directly to make sure that the program aligns with your organization's procurement timelines. And finally, I'll note that the grant does work as a reimbursement. So it's only after all of the invoices, scrappage verification, and documentation has been collected that we can release the funding. Next slide. And to be totally honest, it has been hard to find projects to fund. People are, of course, hesitant to scrap a machine that they know for one that doesn't have decades of proven technology behind it. But we know that there are entities out there who want to be on the forefront of electric adoption. And we want them to have the benefit of this funding to help them be the leaders. So the good news is that this means we are pretty flush with grant funds right now. And applicants are all but guaranteed to receive the maximum allowable funding. And we do have evaluation criteria that as the grants become more competitive will help with determining who gets funding. We wanna reduce emissions as much as possible. So the higher the emissions reductions per dollar of grant funds, the better. We want people to push the envelope in Colorado. So if someone is willing to be one of the first to adopt a new technology, we will reward that innovation. And we want the most people to benefit from the reduced emissions. So our priority area is the ozone non-attainment zone, primarily on the front range in Colorado, but anyone in the state of Colorado is eligible and we highly encourage everyone to apply. Next slide. And we've tried to make the application process as painless as possible. So you can find the application on the website, uh, cocleandiesel.org, um, and press the apply for a grant tab at the top of the page. Next slide. And we highly recommend that you review the program guide or get in touch with us directly before you start filling out the project worksheet. Um, the guide details the eligible equipment for replacement and the requirements of the grant funding. Then when you have the details of the equipment you want to purchase and the equipment being scrapped, you can fill out the project worksheet. And finally, you can fill out the application form online, which is very brief. Next slide. Um, and that's it for me. Um, I thank you all very much for your attention. Sorry for not unmuting myself at the beginning. And I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A portion after the presentations from the manufacturers. So thank you so much. Thanks Zuleika and uh, for all our attendees, I just really wanna emphasize that Zuleika and I are here to support you if you think that this grant program could be a good fit for you. Reach out to us directly and we'll really see what we can do to minimize the red tape and all of the bureaucratic work that goes into putting together an application. It's fairly extensive, but we're eager to help support you and make this as painless as possible. And so now the fun stuff. Uh, our first presenter is the CEO of Green Machine, John M. Williams. And I hope this isn't uh, top secret news, but uh, I know that Green Machine has a research and development facility in Boulder, Colorado. So they actually have some Colorado presence and there might be a chance to actually do a live demo and check out what they have going on. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Thanks for having us on. Uh, we've been working on this project for about 12 years and uh, we're excited to be able to show you our offerings and the equipment that uh, we've been building and putting out into the market. Um, Veridia is, is the parent corporation. The product line we're gonna show you is called uh, the Green Machine product line, so. I don't actually have control of the slides, so if somebody does, if we could go to the next one, thanks. Um, <laughs> we tried to capture the whole company on, uh, on, on a coaster for a beer. So um, it, it really started with a crazy idea that was a challenge to build a fully renewable machine 
um, for an application in uh, upstate New York. And uh, we did it on a place they called the east side of Buffalo, which for those of you who aren't familiar with New York State and Buffalo um, is a very challenged section of the city. And it's in a former uh, automotive manufacturing facility. So this used to be a GM facility where we're producing the equipment right now. Um, I, I think, you know, to a certain extent, I'm, I'm repeating things that most of you on this call know. Um, renewable equipment is just a much better machine overall. You, you get better performance, you get a better return on your investment. The equipment is intrinsically safer on a job site because of the noise and the operating parameters. Um, it's emissions free, but the emissions free part of it is not the driver that we've seen with most customer adoption. Most of our customers use the equipment because it, it performs the task in the field much better than the diesel counterpart. So uh, next slide. Uh, just, just a quick illustration of, of what the equipment looks like compared to the diesel counterpart. Um, a typical 8,000 pounds uh, compact excavator, you know, releases about 20 metric tons of emissions in an annual average run cycle. Um, our machine has zero. Uh, from an operating cost standpoint, it's really not even close. Depending on your cost of diesel fuel and, and the cost of your labor in the particular market, um, that machine, you know, somewhere around $10 an hour to operate, the electric equivalent's about 42 cents. So very dramatic from an operating cost standpoint. Again, a comparison of torque and, and operation uh, metrics. The interesting thing about an electric motor, and again, I don't want to repeat this if most people on the call already understand it, but an electric motor has no torque curve. So when you use it to power a hydraulic pump and you're, and you're at low RPM, you can't stall the electric motor. So you can do things with this equipment much more delicate and much more intricate than you can with a diesel because you can run it at slower speeds and have much better control when you're working around utilities and fiber optic lines and, and even personnel that are in the work zone and interacting with the machine on a repair or replacement of a utility. Uh, this is a, a lineup of the equipment that's in the market in 21. Um, it's, there's a 8,000 pound excavator, a 2,000 pound excavator, and then a small uh, skid steer loader. Um, these machines are being replaced in 22 with uh, a full lineup of equipment that's on a Bobcat platform. So, uh, Electric light tower, which uh, the funny thing was that we made the first excavator, the biggest complaint about the machine was all the operators could hear was the light tower in the background running. Um, <laughs> light towers tend to run on very small diesel engines and make a lot of noise. And uh, it, was, it was, became much more apparent when you took the noise from the machine away. So uh, the products that we have out today are really demonstration products to show how this fully electric platform can really replace small diesel engines and, and perform the tasks, the functions, and the requirements in the field at a higher level than the diesel engine can. click to the next one or I can keep talking about this one if you'd like. Um, so I'm not sure if this is going to work on the screen or not. We give it a try, but this is a product that's going to be on the market in 22. This is, this is the world's first fully electric um, track skid steer. And when I say fully electric, this machine has no hydraulics. It has no fluids. Um, the the movement or the motion cycles for the bucket and the arms are done with electric actuators and the drives are fully electric. So, so this is a pack, um, four electric actuators and a drive motor. And if you hit the play button, hopefully it, uh, it works. Now, now this machine right now is running in ludicrous mode. 
Um, so we tuned it way up just to see what we could do with the technology. And uh, it, it outperformed the diesel by about three times. So it was 3x faster. It was 3x more powerful. The challenge was we destroyed the frame of the machine. <laughs> we had so much torque on the drive motors and so much lift capacity on the cylinders that uh, we broke the chassis in about 27 different spots. But <laughs> we've since turned the electronics down and we've reinforced the chassis. Um, there's about 10 of these right now that are out in the market running around with different customers. There'll be 300 produced next year. And uh, it'll go into scale production in 23. Uh, this is a this is a, a, a Bobcat um, one metric ton excavator that'll be in the market in 22. This replaces the one ton machine we had in 21, um, and and this is a really really nice machine. It's got onboard charging. Um, you get about six and a half hours of continuous runtime. And this is a machine that runs on about a 50% duty cycle. So you'll get, you know, one and a half to two days of operation on a single charge. Um, it charges off of a standard EV connection. So you can plug this into any EV charging station that uh, is available, or you can charge it off of a 110, uh, a 110 15 amp circuit. Uh, this is an E20, which is a, a two metric ton machine based on a Bobcat platform. Uh, very similar onboard charging. Um, we, you know, we're getting just over five hours of continuous runtime on this platform. Um, and again, the same parameters for charging and operation and everything else. Uh, the E32, and you kind of see a pattern here. The 20 is a two metric ton. The 10 is a one metric ton. The 32 is a 3.2 metric ton. Um, so larger platform, uh, very capable machine. This is a high voltage unit. So this runs at about uh, 150 volts um, as opposed to 48 volts on the other two platforms. Again, um, you get plenty of runtime power and capacity. Um, the nice thing about this machine is, is it's really adaptable and it's probably the most popular compact excavator in the market in North America from a weight class. So there should be a lot of adoption and a lot of change out application for this platform. Um, case, uh, we, we got another short video for you. So this is a 580 case, which is a 18,000 pound all wheel drive uh, tractor backhoe. This is the world's largest fully electric construction machine in the field today. Um, there's five of these running around. Two of them are with uh, very large utilities in the Northeastern United States. Um, and it's just a very, I call it a very cool machine, but um, it, it really shows how far you can extend this technology given the um, engineering and support constraints we have today. Um, and this machine currently is in the city of Boston running every day and working on utility projects. If you, you can hit that video, it'll give you a little taste of the machine, I think. So this was a demonstration that was done in Albany, New York. Um, and it was really the first time the operators had been in the machine and had a chance to run it. Uh, and, and much like an electric vehicle, uh, when you're using this machine because it drives, you just get much better performance. It's much more responsive to the operator. Um, and on this particular platform, on the diesel version, everything runs off the same hydraulic pump. So when you're going into the pile to lift something, you have to keep your foot on the floor of the diesel engine. So you end up over revving the engine to compensate for the hydraulics. On the model that we designed, we separated the movement hydraulics from the transmission on the truck so that as you go into the pile, you don't have any energy loss because you can run the hydraulics independently of the drivetrain. So, you know, the thing we're finding out with this equipment is because it's been designed to an unlimited source of energy, which is the diesel engine, it's very wasteful. Um, we, 
we're finding out that over 50 to 60% of the energy that's available on that, that's available from that diesel engine actually gets wasted in the hydraulics, the transmission and the output of the machine. And it just gets wasted because nobody's ever had a design to an efficient model. So as you convert to electric, there's huge pickups in energy usage that really allow you to convert this equipment and do so and, and get runtime and everything else that we want. A um, little testimonial from National Grid. Um, the, the, and, and while this is a great testimonial from their operator, I'm not going to read it, but the best testimonial in my mind was when I went down to visit one of the project sites, the operator got off the machine, he walked over to me and he goes, you know, do you have something to do with this thing? And I said, yeah, I, I, I actually am I'm one of the people that's working on it. And, you know, it's, it's our product. He goes, I just want to tell you, I've been running equipment for 27 years. And after I got on this thing, I'll never get on a diesel machine again. And, and I think that said it all because he really didn't care about the fact that it was renewable. He didn't care about the fact that it was green. His only metric was it did the job better. It made no noise and it was easier for him to get his work done. Uh, and, and, and that's the validation that we really wanted this equipment. We want this equipment to be a better solution for the task that it's being used for not just green and renewable and, and everything else. It, it's got to perform better than what it's replacing. And, uh, and to date, we've been able to do that. And that's it. Um, I, I'm not sure how much time I had. I tried to be efficient with it. Um, we are open for questions and comments anytime uh, someone has one. Excellent. Thanks so much, John. And apologies to everyone for another technical glitch. Uh, my internet went out very temporarily, so forgive the pause. I know I have some questions for John, but I'm going to save those for the end because we still have two great presenters. Uh, next up, we do have Dr. Ray Gallant with Volvo Construction. So Ray, take it away. Hey, thank, thank you very much for having us on. This is a great opportunity to showcase some of the things we're doing and my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, some stuff coming up, um, both near term and a little more midterm in terms of what we're seeing in the electromobility space. So I'm going to be talking anything from this year and next year availability to four or five years down the road. And the reason for doing that is just to give everyone a flavor of how fast this is actually moving along now. Now that we've reached the tipping point and people are starting to accept these and products are starting to come out, we're seeing a very rapid adoption of these technologies and a very rapid proliferation and diffusion of these machines throughout the industry. So if you go to the next slide. I'm Ray Gallant. I take care of product management and productivity for Volvo construction equipment, which is just basically sales support and engineering application. Uh, for all the products in the Volvo line uh, in the Americas, so North Pole to South Pole, basically. As well as that, I also take care of the sales and operator training, the customer and demo center operations, and develop the product strategies for both product development and technology development for Volvo. So it's a pretty extensive job, and the reason I'm here uh, talking about the electromobility technologies is because that's an important part of what we see as the next group of technologies uh, that we've got to focus on. And it fits well with one of Volvo's core values, which has always been environmental care. Um, as far as education, I am an engineer by trade, uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and Bachelor of Science in Forest Engineering. And then I did my master's and doctorate in uh, business and business management. So. Next slide. If you look at what Volvo sees as direction going forward, first of all, we have a very extensive line of equipment, as most of you probably know, uh, going anywhere from small one ton excavators right up to 95 ton excavators, 60 ton articulated haulers, 100 ton rigid trucks. Uh, so there's a variety of different applications, a variety of different power draws, and a huge variety of different. Um, situations that we're going to find this equipment in. So as would be expected, 
there's not one solution that's going to fit every application and be the right solution for everything. So we're looking at a number of different technologies and developing them in parallel. So if you look at the small equipment, we think the way to go and the products we've introduced are a straight battery electric uh, drive, like John was just talking about. So we put lithium ion batteries into this equipment and power them and you recharge the battery at the end of the day or during the, during the duty cycle, if you wish. Um, and that's a very efficient way to get to zero emissions. And you also get 90% uh, sound reduction. You also get no vibrations. It's a very comfortable, easy machine to work with. If you get into the midsize equipment, we're looking at more battery electric drives, but also getting into hybrid drives. So there's different kinds of hybrids we can look at. Some are zero emission. Others are a small diesel engine that has a small amount of emissions, but it's still much better than running a full out diesel uh, to do the job. When you get into even larger than that, in quarry, aggregate sites, mines, things like that, the transfer stations, there's a possibility to do direct hookup to grid electric and run the machines off that. And quite often these end up being dual powered machines. So you'll have, in the case of an autonomous hauler, you'll have a small battery pack, but it recharges very often uh, from the grid. Uh, in the case of wheel loaders and excavators, you can hook them directly to the grid and work your operations that way. But you still have a diesel backup in case you don't have a grid connection or you want to go temporarily to another site and work for a few hours at another site. You can work off diesel just like any other machine. And then finally, when you get to the very high end of our range, you get 600 plus horsepower up to 1000 horsepower. You get into alternate fuels being a possibility and even fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cells, uh, something like that to power the equipment. So it gives you a number of different technologies that we're gonna see coming forward. And as I said, these are not long-term development. These, I'm not talking 10, 20 years in the future. I'm talking within 25, 26, you'll see all these different technologies started merging on the market. Next slide. So the first one we've launched in uh, Volvo's case are two small compact excavators or 48 volt compact piece of equipment, uh, ECR 25, two and a half ton mini excavator and an L25 uh, compact loader. They're both available uh, for order now and delivery in 2021, in spring of 2021. And we have three models to follow this up mid 2021. So by the mid next year, you'll have five models available from Volvo. And we made the commitment in 2019 that all of our compact line would have electric variants available. So these are not just try machines or show machines or demonstrators. This is part of our main line in compact equipment. It, there'll be an electric variant for every piece, every model we make. Next slide. And of course the advantages of electric, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I think John covered it quite well. Uh, it's obviously emissions free, it's quiet. We're seeing 90% uh, sound power reduction in these machines and they're quiet enough that you can comfortably talk from an operator to a worker um, in, a, in a normal voice, in a normal uh, conversational tone. You can talk to each other and, and hear what each other is saying. And I just spent three days at the Utility Expo here demonstrating these machines to a lot of customers. And it's really nice to be able to stand beside the machine and talk to the operator as he's trying it in a normal voice. It's a, it's a kind of a weird feeling not having to yell to him. Um, one of the limitations of the battery electric drives is the infrastructure available. And that's something we're paying a lot of attention to at Volvo to make sure that when we deploy these, there is always an infrastructure, a way to charge the machines that doesn't disrupt the customer's job. So the most important thing is not only do, can we replace the diesel equivalent, but we can give extra features and not be a hindrance in any way on his job. And that's where it comes into the, the fact that it's opening up new doors, new applications that the customer could not do before. Things like indoor work or in sensitive areas 
or around foodstuffs or livestock or any of those jobs. Uh, customers didn't want to bring a diesel machine to do those types of jobs. They did it by hand. Uh, now they're looking at these machines as a very real possibility to do that work. Next slide. And if you take a look at the specs, one of the things we committed to is we're not going to compromise to the customer when he's buying one of these machines. So he expects a two and a half ton excavator to perform a certain way. We're guaranteeing him and it will. And if you look at these first two machines that we've produced, the reach and digging depth are identical because we're using the same boom and arm components but the breakout force and operating weight are actually enhanced to the diesel. So it's actually a stronger, more powerful machine. And similar to what John pointed out, because the electric torque is immediate at low RPM, the machine even feels more powerful than its diesel equivalent. So when he's starting to break out, when he pulls the lever to curl a bucket, for instance, it's instantaneous. He has full power available and the operators really like that and appreciate that. On the loader, the effect is even more dramatic. If you look at the breakout force, uh, we're up about 30% in the breakout force on the loader on the same size machine. So it's pretty dramatic. And by placing the batteries in the rear to replace the counterweights, uh, we've got a very good uh, balance on the machine so that he doesn't feel that it's unbalanced or that the batteries are a hindrance, even though he's got an extra five or uh, 200 pounds in the machine. So next slide. And like I said, we have to pay a lot of attention to the charging infrastructure. So we've got a lot of different methods out there. Uh, we provide every machine that we sell with an umbilical cord that you see on your left. And it's a standard EV plug-in. It's a J1772. So he can go to any roadside stand and plug in there, or he can plug in using this umbilical, he can plug into a household 110 or 240 volt uh, NEMA outlet. So that's a very easy charging method. We also sell fast chargers uh, through the Volvo network. So if the, the middle uh, is a 480 volt input grid connected charger, it is 48 volts DC direct. Uh, to the machine and it will charge an excavator in about an hour full charge and a loader in about two hours. So it's a very efficient way to either top off the charge or recharge the machine if you choose to do that. And it also happens to be the same plug and same structure that you have with the forklift, electric forklift. So if any customers have electric forklift in their operation, they can easily plug in and recharge the machine. And finally, on the right, there's a solar powered charger that we partnered with a company called Beam Global in San Diego. And that will either charge your EV car or a couple of machines or whatever you want. It's a standard J1772 plug and it runs totally off sunlight, no infrastructure, no preparation. As long as you have a flat surface, you can deploy that in about 45 minutes. And then you're up and charging. And when you're done your job, you fold it up put it on a trailer and take it away. So it's a very efficient solution for a contractor opening up a new site. Next. So it doesn't look like we have sound here, but what this is, is customer testimonials. We had these machines on in working customer sites for the last two years. And basically what the customer testimonials they're referring to uh, are two things, basically. One is the quietness uh, and lack of vibration, lack of noise. And one of the operators is talking about how much at the end of the day that made a difference. And he didn't even realize how tired he was sitting on a machine all day operating it because of the vibration and noise. And he said, at the end of the day, he said, I got more work done and was less fatigued than I was with my equivalent diesel machine. And then the other operator was relaying that the performance of these was actually superior to the diesel machines he was running. And then they talk a little bit about special applications like running indoor where they didn't even have to have fans to exhaust the emissions. They just closed the doors and ran indoors all, all, all day. Okay, next slide. We are coming out with some other um, 
machines, and this will this is a bit more future. But we have a 23 ton excavator. You notice it's in the yellow color. It's in the typical Volvo colors. Uh, it is out for customer trials right now. It's a 23 ton excavator. We bump up to a 600 volt uh, lithium ion battery pack. In this case, it runs today about a 4.5 hour uh, digging duty cycle. So that's you know hard work. It'll do about 4.5 hour. But before we launch, we expect that to get up to a full eight hour duty cycle. And that's just an indication of how quickly battery technology and energy recuperation and energy efficiency are going in these machines. So we wanted to get this out, wanted to get it in customer's hands and test it, but we realized that we, we've got to aim for an eight hour duty cycle. And again, it's got the same or superior performance to a conventional diesel. Next slide. And then we get into some more exotic technologies. So we are working in the picture you saw fading out there. Uh, that is highly confidential, but we are working on hydrogen fuel cell uh, machines. And the advantage of that is you put hydrogen, compressed hydrogen gas in, which is very quick to refuel. It goes into the fuel cell and produces two things, electricity and water. So it's a 100% zero emission uh, machine, but it's direct electric drive to your drive motors in the machine. So it's a very efficient, very good way to power a machine when you get into that high power application. So we're starting off with articulated haulers, but you will see other uh, models of Volvo equipment come out with fuel cell drive. We are also experimenting with hydrogen combustion engines. Uh, so again, a zero fuel engine. It combines hydrogen and oxygen in the air and produces a waste of water dripping out your tailpipe and then your power in the engine. And the beauty of this is the conventional diesel block can be used to do this. So we manufacture our own engines, of course, and we can modify our engines to run on pure hydrogen. Next. And finally, we're working on a number of machines that are grid connected. And these are the dual powered machines I talked about. So the 70 ton excavator you see was on the right, was connect, had a full diesel engine, and you were able to use that one in regular excavator mode or hook it up to electric. And then you had zero fuel cost, zero emission, and you ran totally off the grid. And in this particular case, the customer generated his own electricity. So basically his running costs were zero for it. So, and then next slide. And this is just kind of a picture. These are commercial machines. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that we have a fully autonomous hauler. It's a battery electric machine, zero emissions, zero noise and zero operator. It just goes where it needs to go, does what it needs to do all day. Um, and we have these deployed. And this is one of the things that we feel is the next step in the evolution of these electric and these autonomous machines. So with that, next slide. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to present and I look forward to any questions. All right, thank you so much, Ray. And finally, for our last presentation, we have Joe Shinasi with Kovaco Electric. And so, Joe, over to you. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, everybody. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Joe Shinazi. I'm the business development lead in the Americas region for Kobaco Electric. It is a great honor to be invited to speak on this esteemed panel today with Green Machines and Volvo. Uh, we are familiar with EV grant programs such as this. Some of our machines are currently in the application process for equivalent grant programs in California. And we're very happy that other states, in particular Colorado, are offering such programs. It does make a difference. Um, so very grateful for your time today. So let's get into it. Uh, Covaco Electric is an OEM manufacturer of electric skid steer loaders. You see the, our two models featured here. We currently have the Elise wheeled skid steer and the Mini Z miniature track loader. Next slide, please. So I'll start with a brief history of the company. 
Uh, Kovaco Electric was chartered by Kovaco Company, a 30-year-old firm based in Bratislava, Slovakia, which was concentrated primarily in the manufacturing of welding positioners and attachments for other brands of heavy equipment. In 2014, in a desire to innovate, Kovaco decided to expand their product line. Instead of just making quality attachments for other brands of skid steers, they decided they would make their own skid steer, but they wanted to develop an evolved version of uh, that machine. Thus, Kovaco Electric was born. Recently, uh, the company was spun off from its parent, and today it is a fully independent company with both its headquarters and factory located in the Czech Republic outside of Prague. So these machines are made in Europe. Next slide, please. The Elise 900 pictured here is Kovaco's flagship electric skid steer model. It was the first and is still the only, as far as I uh, understand, commercially available full-size electric skid steer loader in the world today. Uh, that is at least until the Bobcat T7X hits the market for uh, John's presentation earlier. Um, but uh, as of today, it's still the only full-size commercially available skid steer available, electric skid steer available. The 900 moniker represents the machine's minimum lifting capacity, roughly 900 kilograms or uh, 2,000 pounds with the smaller battery configuration. Uh, there's a larger battery configuration that is available that offers a lift capacity of 3,000 pounds. Next slide, please. Um, again, more on history. The, the Elise was conceived in 2014. It was prototyped in 2016 and first sold in Europe beginning in 2018 and then sold internationally, including in the United States uh, beginning in 2020. Uh, happy to announce Kovaco sold its first machine in Colorado uh, to a company called Net Zero Construction um, in 2021. Uh, the current Elise model is the second generation. And uh, R&D is currently underway for the uh, third generation, which is expected to come sometime in late 2022 or 2023. Next slide, please. So the Elise is a fully electric zero emission skid steer loader. As expected of any electric vehicle, it is very quiet, especially when compared to its diesel or gas counterparts. Elise has three electric motors, two powering the drivetrain and one powering the hydraulic system. Um, we have hydraulics still uh, to make available uh, um, the entire universe of existing attachments that exist. Uh, the Elise comes with a standard plate. Um, but uh, as mentioned in the third evolution of the machine, we, we uh, are exploring um, electric actuators as a replacement for the hydraulic system. Um, and, and then going back to another thing that John referenced uh, earlier, um, the, the machine is geared towards efficient operation. So uh, as mentioned, there's three electric motors, but uh, when the operator is not driving the machine. When only the boom is in operation, the two motors powering the drivetrain shut down, uh, uh, saving energy um, and extending the, bat the battery life. Um, the machine overall is powered by a 96 volt lead acid battery, um, which is currently available in various configurations. Uh, we are still using lead acid uh, because it is relatively inexpensive. So it, it allows us to introduce the, the uh, model at a uh, competitive price point to a comparable uh, diesel equipment, diesel piece of equipment, um, but we are exploring um, currently in, in uh, research and development um, lithium ion batteries as a replacement and other battery technologies as well. The standard battery is a 240 amp per hour module offering a runtime run time of two to six hours depending on the usage um, and rated at 30 horsepower. And as mentioned, we have an extended battery uh, which, which offers 400 amp per hours or operates at 400 amp per hours and offers a runtime of eight or more hours, um, which is rated at 54 horsepower. Both batteries are uh, available in either single phase or three phase configurations um, and can be charged uh, at uh, 110 up to 480 volts. Um, the charge time for the battery is roughly five hours. Um, however, um, the 240 amp per hour, the smaller battery configuration is hot swappable. So if you have two batteries, um, they can be swapped in a matter of minutes offering continuous operation of the machine. Um, and we've sold uh, um, some machines to particular operators in that configuration. So they are using it uh, for uh, continuous operation. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, after extensive field testing and several years on the market, the Elise has proven to be very safe and reliable. It has a low center of gravity thanks to the undercarriage batteries, which provides stability and agility, even on sloped terrains. 
And uh, the cabin is certified for both uh, falling object and rollover protection, uh, uh, FOPs and ROPs. Um, also, the machine comes standard with remote operation capability via an included mobile device or an optional joystick. Um, this makes it optimal, optimal for circumstances when in-cabin operation by human being may be undesirable or dangerous. Um, next slide, please. Elise is also packed with a long list. Pardon me, I lost my place. Uh, Elise is also packed with a long list of useful features, including four operating speeds, uh, a self-leveling bucket, micro speed control as slow as 0 0.09 miles per hour, um, regenerative braking, uh, AKA recuperation, um, safety lighting and rooftop beacon, rear camera, um, and many other desirable features. Um, now, if possible, please skip to slide 13 as listed in the bottom right. I don't know if you can see that. But I keep going, yeah. Service and maintenance, one more. There you go, okay. Uh, another major, major advantage of an electric skid steer is the reduced service and maintenance. Uh, as is well known, electric vehicles have many fewer moving parts um, compared to their internal combustion counterparts. Uh, this is also true of uh, the Elise and its uh, little sibling, the Mini Z. Uh, by our own uh, conservative internal estimates, the maintenance cost uh, of an Elise um, over its 3,000 hour life, let's just say, would be would, would come in at roughly 25% uh, of uh, uh, um, the maintenance cost of an equivalent uh, diesel machine. And like other electric vehicles, Kobaco machines offer remote diagnostics, issue log collection, and regular firmware updates to address uh, and, and possibly to uh, remotely resolve issues where possible. Um, regarding the serviceability of the machine, um, there's, as mentioned, there's very few moving parts. Uh, um, so the, and the Elise also employs a modular design allowing easy access and replacement of parts. A full machine teardown or reassembly can be completed within one day. Next slide, please. So uh, as discussed, the Elise is a capable machine, but it's also very versatile. Uh, Elise uses a standard plate, as we mentioned, allowing it to pair with the whole universe of new resale and rental attachments. Um, but uh, Kobako also offers 40 uh, customized e-attachments that were specifically designed to maximize the efficiency of the onboard electrical and hydraulic systems um, and further preserve the battery. So all of these advantages make Elise an appealing option for buyers across a variety of industries, including many prevalent in Colorado, um, interior construction, demolition, uh, road construction, uh, and maintenance, snow removal, resort usage, uh, et cetera. Okay, so now let's skip to slide 17 um, and uh, we'll go over uh, the Elise's uh, smaller sibling, the Mini Z. So the Mini Z is uh, back one side. Very good. Okay, Mini Z is Kovaco's. Uh, Kovaco's uh, uh, offering in the small loader space. Uh, its design intention was to offer a miniaturized package of the Elise's unique capabilities in innovative engineering. Um, the 400 moniker here represents, again, the machine's minimum lifting capacity, roughly uh, 400 kilograms or 880 pounds, which makes it relatively strong for a small electric loader. There are other uh, small electric loaders available, including one offered by Green Machine. Um, uh, ours offers is a track loader and offers 880 pounds of capacity. Next slide, please. Like the Elise, the Mini Z is also fully electric, zero emission. Um, it has three smaller electric motors rated at 15 horsepower, uh, again, with two motors powering the drivetrain and one powering the hydraulic system. Uh, the machine's powered by a 48 volt lead acid battery, uh, again, with lithium battery uh, um, currently in, uh, in development. Um, and it offers a runtime of up to eight hours. Um, and uh, uh, with a charge time of roughly five hours. Next slide, please. Um, the Mini-Z is controlled remotely by an included Danfoss uh, joystick. Uh, the operator can ride on the included foldable transport platform or walk behind the machine. And then please skip to slide 21, so two slides ahead. Um, one back. Great. Uh, the Mini-Z is... It, Again, it's packed with uh, useful features, including uh, um, a width of only 31 inches, allowing it to fit through doorways. So it's ideal for internal, constru uh, uh, internal construction 
demolition project. Um, 880 pounds of capacity, as we mentioned, uh, multiple operating speeds, uh, also with micro speed control, uh, high hinge pin, uh, and many other desirable features. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, right. And, and again, uh, um, these, uh, sorry, the Mini Z also offers uh, many customized attachments, making it uh, exceptionally versatile. Um, unlike the Elise, the Mini Z comes with a proprietary attachment plate that, that was specifically designed uh, um, to leverage, uh, again, the uh, E attachments that, that are specific for um, the Mini Z. However, uh, there are custom attachment plates that are available, which would allow you to uh, uh, pair with uh, um, the existing new resale and rental. Uh, attachments. Um, that's a, avail those are available as a separate option, but you could leverage, say, uh, um, the attachment plates um, that were designed for um, a Toro Dingo um, or um, a, a comparable uh, uh, mini loader. Next slide, please. So in summary, Kobako Electric currently has two electric skitzer models available in the United States, the Elise and the Mini Z. Both are selling briskly and we are working hard to ensure that that continues. Um, I didn't include any videos here in the presentation, but you can see these machines in action on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, as far as future development plans, the company is focus, focusing its efforts on the following development areas. Um, from an innovation perspective, we're aggressively, aggressively pursuing functional advancements for existing loaders, uh, such as improved battery technologies, telematics, autonomous operation, electric actuators, uh, those areas in particular. And uh, we're also exploring new models uh, where it would make sense to uh, apply our existing intellectual property, um, uh, our electrical systems uh, and, and the, the operating systems. Uh, so that may apply to other small loaders, um, either small cabin loaders or cabinless low profile loaders, uh, and then potentially some other machine applications, uh, perhaps for agri agricultural machines or other types of construction. And that concludes my presentation today. And I want to thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. And thanks to all of our presenters and attendees today. Um, I realize we already are at the, the top of the hour, but uh, our audience has been unusually quiet today. I don't see any questions in the Q&A or the chat. But uh, if you do have any now, I think Zulek and I will certainly be sticking around and hopefully our presenters will be able to stay with us for a few more minutes. Um, if you wanna raise your hand, we can unmute you and allow you to talk directly with, with our panelists today. Um, but you know, there's always the option to follow up with all of us via email and uh, get into more specifics because we, we covered so much great information today. Um, so monitoring the, the Q&A and the chat function, but still not seeing anybody. So I have a question, I guess, maybe we can leave with one question for all of our panelists. Um, for, for some of our attendees that uh, loved one or multiple products on the line, what, and they wanna get their, their hands on one, what's, what's kind of the process in terms of sales and distribution channels for everyone? So we'll start out in the same order as presenters. John, uh, is it a direct sales model? Are people going through case dealership networks or Bobcat dealership networks, depending on the type of machine they want? How's that work? So yeah, so on the, on the Bobcat products, um, you can go to your local Bobcat dealer and you'll be able to buy the machines directly through them. Um, the machine will be supported from Green Machine through that dealership. So you'll have the advantage of a local dealer, um, hopefully a relationship with that uh, retail outlet. The case products in, in 22, there's a limited number of machines. So case actually has a, I think about a hundred units that are committed right now on pre-purchases. Those will go through the case dealers. 
Um, but if you'd like one of those machines, Case has a portal online that you can go and get into the reservation network. Um, so just two different platforms depending on the OEM. Excellent. Ray? Uh, obviously, we go through the Volvo dealer network. So we have dealers all over uh, Canada, the U.S., all over the world, actually. Um, these are construction equipment pieces that I talked about today. There are also electric offerings, of course, in Volvo truck, Mack truck, and some of the other Volvo group companies. Um, but it's through the local dealer, and we support it through the Volvo sport organization as well. Local dealer in Colorado for us is Power Equipment Company. And I see that uh, we have Andrew Redfern with Power Equipment on today's webinar with us. So he would be a good one for, for any potential uh, uh, companies that are interested to, to follow up with. And then Joe. Yeah, for Covaco Electric, we also uh, uh, some machines directly through our dealer network. Our dealers are listed on our website. Um, the dealer for Colorado would be Hammer Equipment. And uh, we actually have uh, uh, Don Cook from Hammer Equipment uh, on the line here today with us. So yeah, uh, the, the dealers are listed on the website and Hammer Equipment covers Colorado. All right. We're kind of taking care of the uh, eight states here on the West. Uh, pretty uh, good piece of equipment that we're selling. I stand behind it quite, quite a bit. Awesome. Now we're finally getting some people out of their shells. So Mike Case asks, does any of the panelists have tow behind electric air compressors? So, so we don't today, but there will be one in 22. There's a product being developed right now on the Green Machine platform uh, that will address that concern. All right. Yeah, there's no air compressors or that type of equipment from Volvo. Uh, we're primarily mobile equipment. Awesome. Yeah, Kovaco also does not offer that at this time. Okay, great. And then Guy Ryan asks, when will the Bob, Bobcat skid steer and the case backhoe be available for demo, demo use in rural areas? So I think that one's directed mainly towards John. Yeah, yeah. so the, the track skid steer is in the market right now. Um, Sunbelt will be the first uh, national um, rental company to have that. Um, Okay, Lush, I'm back. There we go. Uh, so Sunbelt will have that in the market next year. Uh, if you want a demonstration of it, just contact me through the website. And uh, we've got 10 machines running around the country right now. We'd be happy to swing by Colorado and do a demonstration. Thanks, John. And then uh, Brad Van Meter asks, is there a link to the Colorado Clean Diesel Program with regard to the grant opportunities? Yes, there is. We will certainly put that in the chat, um, but then that will certainly be included in the subsequent email that we're going to be sending to all attendees, along with the slides and the recording of this webinar. And Zuleika just entered the uh, website into the chat. It is cocleandiesel.org. And from there, you should pretty easily be able to navigate and find the, uh, find the application and, and program guide. And Curtis asks, how do attachments on skid, ski, skid steer type equipment affect battery life? So I think, I think there's a couple different answers to that depending on the platform. So I'll, I'll just answer on behalf of the Bobcat platform. Um, the attachments run electrically, the ones that we're building for that machine, um, because there is pretty significant energy on board. We haven't seen a real reduction in runtime based on the attachment. Um, and, and again, it, it depends on the use, right? So if just say you're using a broom on the front of a machine, if, if the operator takes the broom and basically pushes down on it so hard that they're stalling the broom, the broom's gonna pull a lot of energy. That energy pull is gonna be disproportionate to the runtime. So part of the transition of this equipment for operators is understanding how to run it a little differently than hydraulic. But for the most part, if you, whether you're running an attachment or you're running a bucket, we don't really see a huge change in the overall duration of the machine's utilization. That's mostly true for Kovaco as well. Um, some of our uh, 
interested buyers have come to us inquiring if they could, you know, put a cold planer on the machine or uh, a force remulcher. Some of those more intensive type of attachments uh, can uh, deplete the battery faster, we found. Uh, that's a, another area of uh, um, research and development for us is to uh, offer a, um, a high flow machine uh, continuing on the, on the hydraulics or eventually um, the uh, electric actuator equi equivalent that can uh, uh, properly power those types of energy intensive attachments. Um, but for uh, regular day-to-day, um, -day, uh, uh, let's say low flow or mid flow equivalent uh, attachments, there's not going to be much uh, uh, drain on the battery from utilization of those, those types of inputs. And then quick and I follow could up. echo those comments. The most of our equipment that we've been going out, most of the demand we're seeing in there are, are actually for the hydraulic attachments because customers want to use their existing attachments on the machine. But the draw on the batteries from running those hydraulic attachments is minimal. Okay. And then quick quick follow-up going to Joe. Does the Covaco Mini Z have grapple and other front attachments available? It does, yes, and uh, you can see all of those on our website. We have uh, um, several dozen um, attachments, custom attachments made by Covaco specifically for um, the Mini Z, uh, leveraging the, the uh, uh, electrical system uh, um, available on our website. You can see those, um, and then again, um, if you uh, want to use existing implements, we can we can offer a custom plate that will allow you to use. Uh, um, the attachments for, as, as mentioned, like a Toro Dingo or a, a, a Bobcat MT-1000, uh, something like that. With that being said, I've actually just sold some machines up into Alaska that they had to have no emissions to be in the buildings. And uh, the Mini Zs were the products I sold up there. They're absolutely loving the product. I did get grapple buckets for them. They're fulfilling the needs by all means. They're really great machines. Awesome story. All the way up in Alaska. Did you get a you get to go go up there and and, and uh, make a trip out of it, Don? I, I'm actually going to probably here in the next week and a half go up there, check it out, and see how things are working out for them. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, we're almost ten over the hour. I want to give a huge thanks to our panelists for for staying a little bit late with us, along with our attendees. Um, again, we're going to be distributing all of the slides and the recording of this webinar, along with contact information for all of our panelists. So if there's a question that you think of in the aftermath, we're going to be, we're going to be available to, to help answer that. And uh, we're really excited about this opportunity and hope to, uh, you know, assist Colorado organizations explore this technology and whether our grant funding is a good fit for them. So again, thanks so much to everyone for joining us, and uh, we hope to be in touch.